I am delighted to be here um, with all of you, with your trustee or trustees, with your administration, with your faculty, um, with your parents, with your president, but most importantly, I am delighted to be here with what I'm sure is the best graduating class in the history of this university. We are living at an incredible, magical moment in history. Blessed to experience, having been blessed to experience the beginning of a new century and a millennium. How will we say thanks for the life and earth and nation and children that God has entrusted to our care? What legacies and values will we stand for and send to the future through our children to their children and to a spiritually confused, balkanized, and violent world desperately hungering for moral leadership and community? How will progress be measured over the next 10, 100, and 1,000 years if we survive them? By the kill power and number of weapons of destruction we can produce or by our willingness to shrink and indeed destroy the global prison of violence constructed in the name of peace and security? Will our era be remembered by how many material things we can manufacture, advertise, sell, and consume? Or by our rediscovery of more lasting non-material measures of success? a new Dow Jones for the quality of life and justice in our families, national and world communities? Will our legacy be how rapidly technology and corporate merger mania and greed can render human beings obsolete? Or by our efforts to reach a better balance between corporate profits and corporate caring for families, communities, and the environment? Will we be remembered by how much a very few at the top can get at the expense of the many at the bottom and in the middle? Or by our determination to close the huge gap between the haves and have-nots in a world where the net worth of the world's 1,810 billionaires, $6.5 trillion, exceeds the combined income of 152 of the world's nations. 78% of the countries in the world. And when the world's 62 wealthiest people exceeds the combined wealth of the poorest 50% of the population. Something is awry in our own nation when the richest 1% own more of our wealth than the bottom 90%. When the 400 highest income taxpayers earned as much as the combined tax revenue of 20 states in the most recent data, and when the highest paid American CEO took home more than the combined annual salaries of 7,910 childcare workers, something's wrong with that picture, and when the gap between rich and poor has reached historic heights not seen since the 1920s. We have got to reverse course. I quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great um, German Protestant theologian all the time who opposed Hitler's Holocaust, who said that the test of the morality of a society is how it treats its children. And the United States flunks Bonhoeffer's test every hour of every day. And you are the hope of changing those set of values and changing course. It is a disgrace that children are the poorest group of Americans, and the younger they are, the poorer they are, and I'm grateful about what the commitments of this senior class is, this graduating class is, and of this university, and of the founding, your founding president, Elizabeth Harrison, who understood that the future of a nation really rests with the education of its children, the preparation of its children. And so you are really doing the most important work in the world. We have 15, million, 540,000 poor children in America. That's more than the entire population of Illinois, which is our fifth most populous state. And we have 6.8 million of those children, nearly one in 11, who live in extreme poverty, which is more than the populations of Chicago, Springfield, Evanston, and Columbus, and Cleveland, Ohio combined. It's going to be our undoing, and as you and I build that movement to reverse course to try to see how we can make America, America. And we've got to deal with the absolute tragedy 
of our lack of preparation of our children through schools. Um, the majority, and I, and I want to just share with you before I sit down very briefly, an anonymous thing showed up in my desk one, uh, on my desk one day, and it said from somebody, I still don't know who it was, it was an old browned paper, and it says, everything you need to know in life you can learn from Noah's Ark. And the first lesson on this anonymous comment is said, lesson one is don't miss the boat. And the United States is going to miss the boat to lead and compete in our globalizing world because we're not preparing a majority of all of our children for the future. The greatest threat to America's national, economic, and military security does not come from any external enemy. It comes from our failure to invest in and educate all of our children. Every nine seconds of every school day, a child drops out. Every 34 seconds, born into poverty. A majority of children in all racial income groups and over 80% of black and nearly 80% of Hispanic children, who are soon going to be the majority of our child population, cannot read or do math at grade level in fourth or eighth grade in Illinois. Figures mirror these. Any nation that fails to prepare most of its children from, for productive work and life must correct course and correct it now. What is a child going to do in this globalizing and competitive world they can't read or compute at the most basic levels? You're just handing them to that prison pipeline and we're going to break up that cradle to prison pipeline and stop incarceration being the future that too many of our children see. A majority of our states in Illinois is a little bit better, not really a lot better, but spending three times more, Illinois is spending two times more per prisoner than for public school pupil. That's about the dumbest investment policy we could make. And we've got to break it up and make sure that with caring teachers and administrators and giving them a high quality early childhood education, which is so important. If you don't have a floor to your house, if you don't have a strong foundation for your house, you shouldn't be so surprised when children are going into school not ready to learn and schools are not ready to teach them how to learn effectively either, too many of them. And so I hope we'll all become a part of the solution as parents and educators and community business faith and political leaders. But we have got to reclaim our children if we're not going to miss the boat in this competitive globalizing world. The second lesson from this anonymous age was that we're all in the same boat. And a whole lot of folk are very concerned that although we're getting browner and we're getting more African Americans and Native Americans and we're no longer the traditional um, face of what we perceive, some perceive to be of America. Well, we, they may not like these people who don't look like us, like us, but we need to understand we're going to need them to work for us and to be a part of the building of a strong America in the future. And, it's, and poor and non-white children are as much a part of what will build this nation going forward um, as anybody, and I really want to make sure that I'm not supporting them in prisons and they're going to keep supporting us because you've educated them well and our Medicare systems and our health systems are going to remain strong. But I can't think of a dumber investment policy than the fact that most of our states are spending two to three times more to incarcerate a child than to educate a child. That's the wrong set of priorities, and you've got to help change that. The third lesson from this anonymous age was to plan ahead and remember that it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Um, What's going on with our babies today and our investment policies or lack of them in an early childhood system and in our school system is already determining what's going to happen tomorrow. And we need to build that movement to absolutely insist on every child getting the right to a first-rate education so that they can be prepared to work and to compete with anybody and any child anywhere on this globe. The fourth lesson, which I feel very strongly about, is that don't listen to critics and naysayers. I am sure that everybody thought Noah was crazy when he started building that ark because it wasn't raining at the time. But you have to be ready when it does rain. And if you don't want to be criticized, don't do anything, don't be anything, don't say anything, but that's not the way you change anything. And so we've all got to get to be a little bit more courageous and to really step up because children don't vote and they don't make campaign contributions, but we do. And we need to start voting for our children, and that really is voting for ourselves and voting for the valleys of this country and voting for a future.
that we're going to have that's going to be worth having. Final lesson, there are some others, but my favorite lesson, which I'll share today, is to remember that the ark was built by amateurs and that the Titanic was built by experts. <laughs> there are a whole lot of people who are waiting for the experts to come in or the politicians to come in and fix everything that's wrong with our country. Not going to happen. A lot of people are waiting for another Dr. King to come. Dr. King I loved and was influenced by and, 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 and inspired by, but Dr. King never started a single movement. He responded to the, to the welling up of people in across the South and, and across the country. It was ordinary people of grace, the Fannie Lou Hamas and the Joanne Robinsons, you know, the, the Rosa Parkses, but they're mainly nameless people who just got sick of being discriminated against and, and being, you know, disrespected. And he came in and could encapsulate our dreams and inspire us to move further, but it was ordinary people of grace who built this movement of civil rights. And you know, we have to have another movement now. You've got Black Lives Matter, but we've got to make that become a movement that can be sustained. It's hard work building a movement. And it's got to be a nonviolent movement, but it's got to be tough and it has to have staying power. So I'm going to just sit down to say, basically, we're it. And we've got to step up to the plate to save our country from going backwards. And there are people who want to take us backwards. We are still struggling with the birth defects of slavery and Native American genocide, of exclusion of all women from, from the electoral process, exclusion of all non-profit, non non-privileged white men. And we are having a welling up every 50 years of backlash because we have not come to grips with these founding birth defects. And a people who don't know their history and confront their history will repeat their history. And I am absolutely determined that my grandchildren and your grandchildren and children will not have to refight this. We must make sure that our textbooks reflect the truth about our history. And we must make sure that our literature, which our children read, particularly our majority non-white children now, 90% of all textbooks are written for white young people, but they need these diverse children's books as much as our own non-white children need. We've got to monitor as the other side keeps trying to paint the other in the old history. So I want to just sit down and say this is movement time. And nobody can sit on the sideline, but we need to be smart and strategic and tough. And every day I wear around my neck two of my role models, because we also have to understand that intelligence and courage comes in many different colors. And there's Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. And neither one of these brilliant slave women could read in traditional ways. But Harriet Tubman was smart enough to read the, Northern, the North Star and to figure out how to get folk through. For, talk about navigation, talk about whatever, smart. Um, but most importantly, she could read that North Star and take, get, find the way to freedom. But what was most important, and that's my key message to you today, when she got to freedom, she didn't think it was about her. She went back to bring other people to freedom. And we have got to build that movement with all of us, all of us bringing our folk to freedom. And secondly is Sojourner Truth. And she was a tough one. She was an early feminist. I, used to, I loved the stories of her getting on and off Washington trolleys, and they would put her off, and then she'd run to the next stop and get back on again, and they'd put her off, and she'd keep running and catching on, and she says, if the women want to have their rights, they better stand up and take them. But she was really, really smart. She couldn't read either in traditional literature terms, but she absolutely remembered everything she heard, everything from the Bible, and she did not not speak out about what she thought was just and right. And my favorite Sojourner quote came one day, which I think is the lesson for how we build movement together, occurred when she was being heckled by an old white man who said, old slave woman, I don't care any more about your anti-slavery talk than for an old flea bite. And she snapped back at him and said, that's all right, the Lord willing, I'm going to keep you scratching. <laughs> there are too many people who want to be big dogs whole big press conferences and who think it's about them. That's not what movements are about. Movements are about strategic fleas. Enough fleas biting strategically can make the biggest dog uncomfortable. And you need to make a commitment today 
because I've watched this fleet corps over the decades and we've gotten huge progress. Disabled children can now go to school and no good deed goes unpunished because then they mess up to find new ways of keeping children from having an equal right to an education. You know, we've got Head Start, started off at 375, it's now at 6 billion. We're gonna get a early childhood system. We've got child care block grant. We need to make it a universal, high quality early childhood system for every child in America. And we will get that if you bite with your votes, if you wear down those congressmen. We don't need everybody, you just need a good 5% to just say we're gonna get an early childhood system and let's work on one big thing a year. And I've watched the Fleet Corps win, um, you know, grow over the years and there are 40 laws in the books that were not there but it cannot be done without you. So what I want to part from you with is you just be, make a commitment to be a strategic flea, that you don't let a child be mistreated in your presence. Speak out against that. You don't let people treat children unjustly. If you are seeing that your public officials are not doing what they should do for every child, speak out about that. Vote, organize, go to school board meetings, run for, school boards, and when you get on the school board, don't think it's about you. Make sure that you keep children in the middle of the table. But I am so grateful to you for the careers you have chosen. It's the most important thing you can do. I'm trying to keep everybody out of law school. I'm trying to send everybody into education because that is where the battle is, and I'm grateful that you have heard the call. Godspeed.